Dr. Nielsen and I try and do a lot of is collaborate and work together and we spend a lot of time together making decisions and talking about things and, and we try to model that from our positions in central office all the way down to, to everybody in the district and, and we just think it's really important that we show that collaboration is, is hugely important in what we do. You as paraeducators um, collaborate every day with our staff and with our students here at, at the Ashes Public Schools and without you quite frankly a lot of our days would would be a miss without having you be part of that so we want to say thank you for that we want to continue emphasizing the importance of collaboration with yourselves and with your teaching staff and those that you work with in your buildings as well as cross buildings as well um, one of the things that I think we struggle with is, is being able to find time, quite frankly. And that's the way the world works, right? Time is, that four-letter word sometimes is more important than a lot of others that we can think of. But it's very hard to find. And, and what we've tried to do in this next four weeks is carve out some time where we could, we could do a couple things. One train and give you some tips to have in your toolbox when you're working with kids or you're working with staff or whatever the case may be when you're collaborating to utilize to help you in situations that you may not have otherwise expect, expected to be in. And we know you get put in those situations and, and trust me, um, your work that you do with kids on a daily basis is not only greatly appreciated but it's greatly important. So this next four weeks is designed to give you some tools in your toolbox 
to be able to, to work in situations that you may not have expected to be in. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions. And folks, there, there are no crazy questions. So if you have one, please ask. That's what collaboration is about. This time is geared towards helping you feel better and more confident about what you're doing on a daily basis with kids and also on how to communicate with staff that you may need to communicate with about what's going on. Don't be afraid to ask for help. That's what we're here for. I guess, lastly, what I would want to say to you is thanks for being part of our team. You have chosen probably uh, a very uh, difficult position and you have chosen to do it honorably. But the thing that I want to emphasize with you, and Dr. Nielsen's going to talk to you about some of the, some of the things that come along with, with being a paraeducator or being an er educator in general, is you've chosen a profession where the rewards really come long term. And you'll see some of those throughout the next year. For those of you that have been doing this, and then I see some familiar faces that have been here for a few years, you know that those rewards come when you're in the grocery store. And little Susie or little Johnny or little whoever that that day may have been a handful that you worked with comes up and wraps their, arm, their arms around your leg and says, hi, it's good to see you. What are you doing at the grocery store? Don't you, aren't you supposed to be at school? <laughs> those are the rewards that quite frankly you can't ever replace in the job that you do. And they're magical moments that I promise when they hit you, will hit you pretty hard and will hit you in the heartstrings of what, what it is that you spend your time doing on a daily basis. And folks, in my opinion, and I, I'm, I've been an educator for 29 years now, I can't think of a more rewarding profession to be in, a more rewarding experience to work in than helping a child grow and develop. And that's what it's all about. We take them more from where they come to us and we help them develop into the people we want them to be and learn the things they need to learn. And you being a part of that is so important and so honorable. So thank you for that. Thanks for being here. I hope this next four weeks does a couple things for you. I hope it answers some questions. I hope it provides you with some tools for your toolbox. And I hope that when we get that first snow day and you get that phone call and if you say, I don't have to go to work today because we're, we're not having snow. But wait a minute, I'm not getting paid. I hope it makes up for some of that time, okay? So know that there's, there's multiple benefits to being here this, this next four weeks, but the main one is that you get an opportunity to change the lives of kids. So thank you for being part of that, and thank you for being part of our team. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Okay, thank you. I think he has said everything that I want to say, <laughs> but I am going to um, just lead into introducing that. Nick? Um, as our speaker. But before that, what I want to do is I would like to make a plea with each and every one of you to go out and find a friend who is not doing anything and you think they need something to do. Um, and you want to bring them into this great family that we have um, because we know, and I know if you were at Paddock Lane in the ACP classroom today, you thought, holy cow, how are we going to do this? Um, we are short. Paris, we are short um, cafeteria staff, we are short custodial staff, maintenance crew, we are short. But we know it's not just Beatrice Public Schools. There was an article in the paper yesterday about the Sheriff's Office. They are short staff too. So we know it's nationwide. But if you know of someone that would be great at touching lives and making a difference, um, we would love to have them be a part of the team. The other thing is, we also know that you are busy, and there are some of these Wednesdays that you cannot make because you have set this appointment, <coughs> or you have kid stuff that you've got to take care of, or you've got to go do other things. If you are not here, we are recording these right now, so we will send them to you. We would just ask that you watch it on your own time, and so anyone who has not signed in today, I will send a message to um, with the video recording. Hello, welcome. Get signed in and make sure you get clocked in. Too. Yep. So um, I will send out the recording. Just watch it on your own time, and then I will have you fill out a form. It'll be a different one than Jackie B uses because I will help her out, and I will get this all added to your timesheet. 
but it will be, hey, I watched this video, here are three things I learned, and then um, I will add that time to your timesheet. So you can do it, let's say Friday night, you have nothing else better to do than to, <laughs> please, hopefully it's not watching a video from us. <laughs> hopefully it's not Friday night. <laughs> um, that is time to relax and not think about life <laughs> for a little while. But if you are just coming in, make sure you get signed in. Also, make sure you get clocked in too. And then I will get you a handout. But now I'm going to turn it over to Matt McNiff. Um, he is in our backyard. We really love that he is at ESU 5 because he does amazing things. And I don't think we use you as much as we probably should. Yeah. So welcome to the address. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Jackie. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. So, um, real quick. Uh, for those who don't know me, there's a few of you that, um, when I was a teacher at Beatrice I worked with, there's a few that were babysitters of my kids in here. There, um, So I know a few of you from, from my time around, but a lot of people I, I uh, don't, and so I apologize for that. Um, just a little bit about me. I started working with kids with behavior challenges like 28 years ago. It was a long, long time ago. And so I started working with juvenile delinquent kids over in a place in Iowa. It was a residential treatment facility where they put gang members from Chicago and Detroit and Philadelphia and all of those kind of places, all in one place in Iowa. And so I worked there as a teacher and a counselor for several years. Um, I met my wife there. I married way outside of my ability level. If you ever get that chance, I highly recommend it. Um, she's smarter than me. She's beautiful. She's uh, She's also uh, been my boss on three different occasions, including this one. I'm the special education director out there. She's the superintendent, for lack of a better term, out there right now. Um, so at work, we have very clearly defined roles. She is my boss. And when we go home, we have clearly defined roles. She, too, is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's with a different tone, for sure. Um, I, I speak to paragroups all over the place, um, and I love, I love talking to paras because I, I want to stress how much I appreciate the work that you do because you guys are some of the least paid staff, you guys have some of the hardest to reach kids, and I think that you guys do so much for the school and for the kids. You have really no idea how much you touch the lives of those kids. Um, but I'm here to tell you how much you do. After I left Iowa, I came to Beatrice Public Schools where I took over a mid-year position, which always means things went really well ahead of time. Uh, um, and I worked for three years, uh, for three and a half years, four years uh, at Beatrice Public Schools before I became a behavior consultant for 10 years at ESU 5, where I worked with nine out of the 10 school districts around this area, and now I'm special education director for the past six years. Um, I, uh, I got two kids. These are my two kids. This is a little older picture, but those are my two kids. Jackson is on the right. He's actually a senior this year, and that's tough for Dad uh, because he's so much like me except better in every single way. So I just, I'm like, dude, you're never going to kiss a girl in high school if you keep this up. Um, he's a good kid. He's way smarter than I ever was. He's way stronger. Wait, uh, he just, ah. Uh, but I also see all the mistakes that he's going to make. Anybody in here raising a kid who's exactly like them? Yeah, that's a struggle. Ben is on the left. Now, my wife and I have been in uh, uh, special education, uh, working in, with special ed kids for years and years and years. And the good Lord said, you need your very own special needs kid. And I said, we don't want one. <laughs> and he said, tough, you're getting one. And so we got that. Ben has classic autism. And, and Ben... Um, Ben is the reason why I love Paris so much, and, and it is a deep love because um, since Ben hit kindergarten, actually when he went to a special preschool up in Lincoln, he's had a para with him every single day. Um, the things that that para educator Lynette has done for my son has been things like teaching him how to be able to speak, how to be able to say, I love you, Daddy, when I put him to bed at night. Uh, being able to um, uh, being able to have better manners, being able to, to, to be able to function, the things that he does, that she does for my kid. She comes over every summer, we pay her, and she's our nanny for the entire summer, and she works on this program all summer. 
I can't tell you how appreciative I am for what you guys do because there are people that are going home tonight that are going to be better versions of themselves because of the work that you did today. And so I want to say thank you. I'm very, I, I, I'm very happy that you guys have chosen to do this. Um, okay, so kind of my philosophy of education. I got it back when I was 18 years old. I worked at a camp called Camp Kentucky, and at the end of the summer, they, they made us um, a, a corny ritual. They knighted us. They, they put a sword on each shoulder and said, go out and save the world, and they made us take this oath. And in this, and in this oath, I found what kind of drove me. And so, so I didn't quite understand it at the time. But as the more I said it, the more I lived it, the more I had it up on my wall in my apartment. I have it up in my office today, and it's this, that I understand that our mission is to save the world. A magnificent obsession of loving and caring for ourselves and others, especially children, for in them is our greatest hope. Now, the thing that I kept coming back to and still come back to the, today is that our mission is to save the world. I mean, what more noble thing is there than to go out and be able to save the world, right? And at 18 years old, I didn't understand that. But I kept coming back to it and wanting to wrap my mind around it. And then, and then I had my own kid. And I had two kids. And my world changed overnight. And anybody in here who has children know, your world becomes that person the minute you hear them cry the very first time. That's your world. And you guys, the, people from all over the community of Beatrice are sending their kids to school every single day with their hope that there's somebody else out there that believes in their kid as much as they do, that love their kid as much as they do. Now, I've worked around enough Paris that I know that you guys are in that situation as well. That yes, they try your patience, yes, they're hard, but you guys don't stay in this job because of the money. You don't stay in the job because you're gluttons for punishment. You stay for those little things, those little, small little things that those kids unwrap and provide you as a present every single day. And so I thank you for that. Okay, so I'm gonna be doing two sessions for y'all. One this week, and I think one in a couple of weeks. This one is all about how we think about behavior. Because a lot of times we have this idea about behavior. And so I'm going to talk about some of the things that I've learned over the years um, to kind of help shape and model what your behavior philosophy might be. And so the very first thing that we got to understand about behavior is that all behavior is purposeful. There's always a reason behind the behavior that we do. And it doesn't matter if it's adult behavior or kids' behavior, we always have a reason behind the behavior that we do. So let's take an adult behavior real quick, okay? How many people in here speed? Yeah, a lot of people. All y'all raise your hands, I know. Okay, I've lived around this area long enough. That... Okay, so why though, okay? What's the reason why somebody in here speeds? Because you're always late. Yes, it's like the world, the universe is stacked against you, and it doesn't matter. You get up at 5 in the morning to be three blocks down the street by 10, and you will get up, and you will snag your pants on a nail. You'll change those and spill coffee down your blouse. You will go out, and you'll find a flat tire. You change that, you, have to, you run out of gas. You fill it up with gas, you hit a deer, and all the time you're going, why didn't I just walk the three blocks, right? Okay, uh, to get there faster. Okay, to get there faster. I don't like being in the car. I just, if I can teleport to the place that I want to be, that's what I want to do. And so I speed to get there. Huh? Who else? Anybody in here have the need for speed? I just like putting the pedal to the metal. Does that cover me? Yeah? Yeah, you just like, oh, there's something about that roar of the engine. Why else? That's why I have cruise control. Cruise control. Why else? Anybody just to get away with it? Where's my, where's my get away with the kids? No? Okay. All right. Um, how about you're listening to an awesome song on the radio, and pretty soon you look down and you're going 90, and you're like, oh, my God. And the school's open. Okay. You got Bon Jovi living on a prayer. Okay. So right now society gives us one way to be able to deal with that, right? 
in order to stop speeding, if you get caught by one of the understaffed sheriffs, <laughs> they might give you a ticket. They might give you a ticket, and you might have to pay a fine, okay? If you get caught. But if we truly wanted to solve the problem, we start to address each behavior for what it truly is. For my person that's always late, maybe we're laying out clothes the night before. Maybe we're going to make sure that our car maintenance is up to scale. Maybe we're going to make sure that we have an organizational chart that we check off to make sure that we have everything in line. And so we're going to organize that person a little bit so that they're on time. Maybe we're going to put the watch five minutes ahead of time so we trick ourselves into it. Okay? For that person that hates being in the car that just wants to get there, maybe we're going to make it a little bit nicer to be in the car. We're going to have a clean car. We're going to have a nice scent that comes out of the out of the air vent, we're going to play nice music that's in there. For the Bon Jovi living on a prayer, people, maybe we're going to slow it down and play a little Barry Manilow. <laughs> for that person who just has the need for speed, just like getting in the car, maybe we're going to give them a Prius. And by the time that they get to where they are, they'll reach right about 60. Or maybe we're going to cap off their car so it only goes 60 to 65 miles an hour. In each of those cases, we actually fix the problem that there truly is, because in a lot of those cases, the problem isn't necessarily that we don't want to give money away. Yes, we don't want to give money away, but the problem truly is time, or we lost track of where we were, or we were listening to a song or something like that. Well, it's the same way in kids in class. A lot of times we might send a kid out of the classroom when that's exactly the thing that they wanted in the first place. So if they create enough ruckus, you're like, go to the office, and they're like, awesome. Thank you so much for that. You're picking up all what I'm laying down. You're awesome. Okay? Where other kids that might be doing it for attention, sending them out of the room, maybe the exact necessary thing to be able to stop that behavior. And so we have to look at the behavior. Why are they doing it? And then we try to attack the problem. Not just getting the kid out of there because we want them out. We try to fix the problem. And so that comes down to, it's called the function of the behavior. What's the reason behind the behavior? A lot of times in schools, it's either escape and avoidance, and we see a lot, a lot of that with our special education kids for things like academics. They don't understand it, so I want to get out of there. Where for other kids, for other kids, it might be for attention. Okay? Context is what gives behavior meaning. There's, there's no behavior in and of itself that's bad. It's just when and where it happens that it's bad, okay? So let me give you an example. When is hitting somebody okay? Somebody said it's not. When is it okay? Boxing, yes, thank you for picking up on the context clue, yes. In fact, if you don't hit somebody back, you're in violation of the rules, okay? When else is hitting somebody okay? What about if you're being attacked? Yes, fight back, defend yourself, absolutely. However, when somebody calls you a booger face, that's much. Okay? That's not the time to hit kids. Well, there's never a time to hit kids. <laughs> if, if a kid calls you a booger face, please, please don't hit. Okay, I'm just going to, for the record, right here, don't hit children. On the record. Anyway, <laughs> off track. Okay, but we got a lot of kids who struggle with what I call gray area behaviors. Okay, so so you guys know um, running at school is okay at some point, right? When? Outside recess. Okay. P. E. Cafeteria? No. In the classroom? No. Hallway? No. And the kids struggle with gray area behaviors. I'll give you an elementary example. You guys have been out on recess duty. You walk over, you see another kid in a headlock. <laughs> you go over and stop it, let him go. What? We're just playing. We're just playing. And the other kid's going, I don't like the way you play. <laughs> okay? Now, that kid goes home. That kid goes home as soon as he hits the door. Younger brother is on the arm of the couch drops the elbow on him. They're wrestling. Older brother comes home from high school, chucks his bag in the corner, gives them both a good kick on the way to the kitchen, gives a snack. They yell, Mom! Mom says, knock it off, okay? Dad comes home. They rough house. Then they sit down for supper and watch Monday Night Raw. Okay? 
the very same things that he spends eight hours a day doing with his family, the people that he loves the most. He goes and does those same things at school to be able to try to make a friend, and then he gets in trouble. Why? Because he doesn't understand that how you do stuff with those people are not the way that you do stuff here. And so we have to explain. We assume that kids know. We assume that they can pick up on all the other context clues, that you see other kids not doing that, that it's not just a brawl out in the playground area, that other kids aren't doing that. So we have to explain and we have to teach those kids a lot of times. Okay? Let me give you an example at the high school level. Okay? Now, you're going to hear a lot about this kid named Adam today. And Adam was one of my favorite kids in school. So Adam is going to be the name of the kid for a bunch of different kids that I've used over the past years, okay? So, Adam used what I call prime time and appropriate language, okay? Damn, crap, hell, okay? If you guys haven't heard those words, I apologize. Okay? <laughs> I say that it's prime time because you can turn on any prime time sitcom and hear any of those words, in fact, a lot of times worse, okay? Now, in my classroom full of kids with behavior disorders, if it didn't rhyme with suck, it didn't even raise a flag in my ear. <laughs> However, in Mrs. Crabapple's room, those words were inappropriate, so I got a phone call. Okay? Matt, do you know what Adam said today? And I said, no, what did he say? He said, this was a bunch of crap. And I said, well, was it? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't find my... Sense of humor as funny as y'all did. Uh, she didn't like that. You need to do something with your kid. I always loved it when they said your kid because I'm like, we got joint custody of this one. So he's both of ours, okay? I said, okay. So I bring Adam in. I talk to Adam. I say, Adam, dude, you can't go into Crab Apple's room and do that. And, and he goes, oh my God. Uh, fine. Well, guess what Adam did the next day? He did it as much as he possibly could to see how fast he could get the red to go all the way to the top. Okay, so I got a phone call. So I'm going to keep Adam after school because he was using inappropriate language. I give Dad a call. I go, Dad, I just want to let you know Adam's going to be with me after school. He used some inappropriate language. We're going to talk about it. And he goes, that effing kid. That effing kid isn't going to effing do that anymore. I guarantee it. Click. <laughs> Got it, okay, so English is in this kid's first language, okay? Army drill sergeant is this kid's first language, okay? Pass the F and mashed potatoes was not an uncommon thing to hear at his house. So Adam, using damn crap and hell, in his mind he was using appropriate language because he wasn't using the other big baddies, okay? And because seven out of the eight other teachers that he had didn't care about it, where Mrs. Crabapple, it was high on her list of priorities on how to be able to save the world, in her mind. She was wrong, by the way. We didn't get along, okay? <laughs> Anywho, okay, so context is what, what gives behavior meaning. When we come back together in a couple weeks, I'm going to show you how to be able to use this to your advantage. Okay, fair does not mean equal, okay? Now, this is a difficult concept for some people to get because a lot of kids and adults both will go, that's not fair. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Now, I need four volunteers. Now, my volunteers get reinforcement. But I'm bringing it, okay? Full size Hershey candy bars. My first four volunteers, all you got to do is raise your hand. One, two, three. Need one more. You wanted to. I saw you raise Three, four. Okay, go ahead and come on up. Okay, so go ahead and take a card and a card. Perfect. Okay. Now, don't show me the card. I'm kidding. I can see what you guys are Okay. <laughs> so here's the deal. When I was growing up, my parents and my teachers both said, you know what, Matt? Anybody can be president. And if I've learned anything over the past 20 years, is that I'm afraid that they might be right. So, I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring, okay? And I'm going to run for president. I hope you have my vote. And today, I'm going to roll out my health care initiative. It's called McNiff Care, because I care. Wait. Okay, so all of these people who come to the doctor, 
unfortunately, and I'm so sorry, you guys all have different maladies that need to be fixed, okay? So, real quick, real quick, we're going to go ahead and start right over here. And what's wrong with you, ma'am? Go ahead and show your card, loud and proud. I have a paper cut. A paper cut. Oh, no, no. You know what, I can fix that. Here's a band-aid. There you go. And what do you have, sir? I don't know about this, but I'm not sure. <laughs> said, well, they should fix the problem, except it doesn't. Now, let me give you another example. Okay, let's take it to school. Okay, we all have these two kids at school, and you all know these two kids. We have Sally Suckup. And we love Sally Suckup. Sally Suckup is the reason we get up in the morning. Sally Suckup is great. Sally Suckup has her homework done. Sally Suckup dresses nicely. Sally Suckup says nice things to me. Sally Suckup says nice things to other kids. She defends the helpless. She's great, and we love Sally. She says nice things like, Hey, McNiff, nice sweater vest. Thank you so much, Sally. I got it at JCPenney <laughs> on clearance. Can you believe it? Now, we also have this other kid. We have Billy. We have Billy Batty. Now, Billy Batty usually sits in the back row. We don't like Billy. <laughs> Billy's rude. Billy's disrespectful. Billy treats us like crap. He says things like, you're not a teacher. Ugh, how many people hate that? <laughs> Billy's rude and disrespectful. He doesn't have his homework done. Usually he wears the same clothes about three, four days in a row. It's kind of stinky. And when you get a chance to check his papers, you make a little bit extra long mark with that red pen. <laughs> we don't like Billy. He says things like, ha <laughs> ha. Nice sweater vest, McNib. <laughs> Couldn't afford the sleeves. <laughs> Shut up, Billy. <laughs> we all know those are kids, but let's break it down just a little bit further, okay? Sally has a pretty darn good life. Sally has a mom who's a lawyer and dad who's a doctor. <coughs> Every problem can be solved in a half hour with a laugh track, and they have the last name Huxtable. And that was a much better joke before Bill Cosby went on. <laughs> <laughs> Things are pretty great. She goes on three different vacations every year. One to see one grandparent, one to see the other grandparent, and one just because. They have a family pass to the Children's Zoo up in Lincoln. They have a family pass to the Children's Museum up in Lincoln. They get to go places. They get to see things. She has a bowl of fruit always there on the counter every single day. There's always somebody there waiting for her. She gets to watch whatever she wants on TV within the right parameters. Things are pretty great for Sally. They have dinner every single night because that's the rule in their house. We're going to sit down and we're going to have conversations with each other about how our day went. That's pretty good. Now, Billy doesn't have that same luxury because Billy's dad has never really ever been in the picture, but there's been a constant rotation of different guys. He's always lived with mom. And really does try her very best. But she ends up having to work second shift at Casey's, and so she doesn't get off until midnight, maybe 1 o'clock sometimes. So Billy, being the fifth grader that he is, he's in charge of his two younger brothers and sisters, and so usually at night the supper is microwave popcorn or microwave macaroni and cheese because that's what they have. He doesn't really have anybody there when he goes home, and so he plays video games. They play video games all night. 
He puts the other kids to bed at about 11 because he knows that's the expectation of mom. And when mom gets home at 12 or 12.30, she doesn't have anybody else there, so who does she talk to? And dumps her problems on this little fifth grade kid who now isn't getting enough sleep and now coming into school. But because she can't wash clothes until that next Tuesday when she has her one day off after the past 10 working that double shift, that's when she gets to go and do that laundry, so he's wearing the same clothes. Should we expect that he has the same exact social skills that Sally does? No, absolutely not. In fact, what we see out of our kids with behavior challenges is that Billy has about three grade level deficit from the rest of their peers when it comes to behavior and social skills. So even though he's a fifth grader, he's operating at a second grade level, which is why you might see your fourth grade kids who are underneath the desk, clawing to it and screaming and yelling, why you're saying, thinking, my God, why are they acting like a kindergartner or a preschooler? Because they have social skills deficits. And if we look at it from a grade level perspective, very similar to how we would look at a reading or a math score. You know, if he was a fifth grader and had a first grade reading score, we teach him. If he had a math score in the first grade level, we teach him at his level. When he has a behavior score at a first grade level, we punish him. Also, what we do is we associate all the other kids and we hold them to Sally's level, except here's the deal with Sally. Sally is three, three grade levels above everybody else when it comes to social skills. So when we're taking the entire class and we're judging them based on her behavior, it's like taking our fifth grade class and judging a kid who's reading at a ninth grade level and saying, this is where you all should be. It's unfair to be able to compare the two. And so if we're taking his social skills and we punish it, instead of teaching it, that's where we have a problem. So we have to look at what is fair. Are we serving him the way that he needs to be served? Are we challenging him the way that he should? And we'll talk a little bit about that too when we come to academics. Okay, here's what I want you to take away from this. People want to be good. Every single kid that we, that we work with wants other people to like them. They want you to like them. They want the other kids to like them. They want their teacher to like them, their parents to like them, and they want everybody to like them. The problem is, is a lot of times they don't know. The reason why I put this up there is because if we have this in our mind that the kid wants to be good, that they will be good if they can, then it means that at this moment they can't. There's a roadblock there. There's something getting in their way. Okay? So when we look at this, get in our head. This kid wants to be good. He can't right now. What triggered it? What got in the way? Because instead of that, instead of looking at that, a lot of times what we do is we look at it and go, this kid just wants to be a pain in my butt. I'm tired of him being a pain in my butt. Get him out of this class. Let's go. And so how can we figure out how to get this kid back to good? We have a lot of kids that, have, that suffer from what I call burn bridge syndrome. Anybody know those kids? Where they come back after the weekend and they are ready to make friends. They are ready to go back out to recess. They've forgotten everything else that happened for the past month where they pushed down other kids, where they intimidated kids, where they screamed in their face, where they did all that. And now they go out and all they want to do is play with the other kids. But the other kids remember all that, right? And so they get back into this pattern. Instead of how do I make friends and how do I get past all of those things, they just go, well, screw you, then you hate me, and they push away. Okay? They want to be good. We just have to teach them how. It's better to be bad than dumb. How many people will believe this? You guys see it every single day, but we're going to demonstrate it, okay? I need a, I need a volunteer, but... This person does not need to come up here. You can stay in your seat. <coughs> All you got to do is answer a simple math problem. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Batty, great. Okay, Billy, stay right there. What's your, what's your real name? What? What's your real name? If it's Billy, I'm going to freak Marshall Tuttle. Marshall. <laughs> Marshall. Okay, Marshall. Here's the deal. I'm teaching a math class. Y'all are in my math class, all right? Yeah, I know the Marshall struggles, but I'm a good teacher. You know how I know I'm a good teacher? Because every single morning when I wake up, I look in the mirror and I go, you're a good teacher. 
Okay? So I know that Marshall struggles. So I've worked with Marshall a little bit on this math problem. Okay, and that's where we're going to start. All right, class, you guys have been doing a fantastic job with the math unit this time. I mean, really, you guys have been knocking it out of the park. So what we're going to do, we've got a test tomorrow, so we're going to do a quick review. And then if we get through the review, no problem, right? I will, uh, we'll, we'll, you guys can hang out, you guys can talk, maybe get on your phones a little bit. That sound good to everybody? Thank you for the few people who are interacting with this. <laughs> uh, okay, so Marshall, you get the first question, man, and I believe in you. Okay, so a particle of mass that is subject to attract a double depth of potential. <laughs> you know what? You know that equation. You've seen it a million times. So what I want you to do is obtain the wave function of the bound states. You don't even need to normalize the function. Go ahead, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marshall, you're, okay, you know what, I'm a good teacher, so I can tell when people are joking, I see that you're joking, yeah, that's the reason why all the other people are laughing. Okay, so Marshall, uh, you know what, I think you know this, okay, Marshall, so and let's do the second one, derive the equations from which the energy eigenvalues can be obtained, go ahead, eigenvalues, okay, put your hands down, everybody, hands down, okay, thank you, go ahead, Marshall, hands down, go ahead, Marshall. Usually the first thing that you think of, that's what it is. Go ahead, give it a shot. <laughs> okay, guys, guys, don't beat it to him. I see him laughing back there. I, I, I know he's screwing around. Don't screw around. Don't screw around, don't screw around Marshall. Okay, go ahead. E equals MC squared. <laughs> okay. Now, Marshall, <laughs> I know that you're being funny, and I'm not going to let you get to me. I'm not gonna let, I believe in you, Marshall. Okay? So, next slide. Marshall, estimate the ground state energy of A approaching zero and A approaching infinity. You may assume that the wave function is even. Go ahead, hands down. Thank you, Marshall. 42. <laughs> Quit beating into him, stop it. Marshall, I tell you what. I know you're making a mockery out of this. We got other people who really need to learn. So here's what we're going to do. We'll see how funny you think it is when we call your parents after school. Hope you don't have anything planned. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Marshall. I appreciate it. Okay. Now, how many of us, if we're looking at something like this, would take a sudden interest in our shoes and hope that we never got a call with you guys? Yeah, me too. And because I don't understand, this is a graduate level quantum physics problem. This is Sheldon Cooper type of stuff, okay? There's no reason why anybody should know this, okay? But how many of our kids start looking at long division who can barely do double digit subtraction and it looks the same exact way? If I was faced with this, what I would start doing, I'd be making a list, I'd be doodling on my paper, I would be writing stuff, I, I'd maybe write on my desk, I'd make fun of the teacher, I'd do all those same things. So when we're looking at this with kids, is this a can't do or a won't do? Because those are two hugely different things. A can't do means they don't have the requisite skills or knowledge in order to perform a test. A won't do means I can do it, but there's something else that's keeping me from doing the homework right now. And that could be anything from parents getting a divorce. I'm going to have to move out of my house. I'm going to lose my friends. I got tripped on the bus. So ask ourselves, is this a can't do or a won't do? If it's a can't do, we teach them. If it's a won't do, we figure out what that roadblock is and we bring it down. Okay? All right. Now, even though they may know what's right, they still may not do it. Okay, how many of you have seen a kid like this? Um, they hit somebody out on the playground. Why did you do that? What could you have done differently? Uh, well, he called my, he said something about my mom. Okay, so what should you have done differently? Well, um, okay, I should have turned around, I should have walked over to a teacher, I should have told him, and I should have let go. Okay, so why didn't you? Well, because he said something about my mom. Okay, so what should you have done? I should have gone over to a teacher, I should have told her what happened, and then I should have walked away and let it go. <laughs> okay? 
How come you did? Because he said something about my mom. Okay, so you all get it. So they know exactly what to do, but they don't have the proficiency or, or the skill or the practice in order to be able to do it. Now let me give you a, an example from the adult world, okay, where this comes very much into place. How many people have, in here have ever been on a diet? <laughs> yeah, a bunch of us have been on a diet. I've been on a bunch of diets, okay? I've been on Atkins, okay? I've been on Weight Watchers. I've, been, I've, I've watched a lot of points. Okay? I've been on Jenny Craig more times than Mr. Craig. I've been... Oh, oh, <laughs> I'm on Weight Watchers now, okay? Which makes me feel... Which makes me feel weird, okay? Because when I was growing up, that was akin to... My mom went to two things, Jazzercise and Weight Watchers. And so to me, I'm like a middle-aged woman watching weight. <laughs> so this middle-aged woman, it's working for her, but yeah. Okay, so we all know what to do to lose weight. Two things. Why? What? What do we got to do? Eat, Eat right. Exercise. Take in less calories than we expend in a day, and bippity boppity boo we lose weight. However, how come I look the way I do? Hands down, I don't need guesses. Okay? I know the reason why I look the way I do. I tend to be a stress eater. So when I go home at the end of the day, I'm confronted with an apple and I'm confronted with a bag of Doritos. And I go, screw you, apple. <laughs> screw you, apple. I'm going to start making out with a bag of Doritos. Okay? It's hard. So with our kids, when they struggle through those things that even though they may know what the right thing is to do, they still don't do it because they don't have the skill set. Why do we have fifth graders that still don't know how to stand in line? Remember that deficit I was talking about? That skill deficit? They don't have that. When it comes to academics, what do we do? We teach things, the base skill. So things like multiplication tables, so that it becomes automatic, so that they can build on higher level things. What do we do when it comes to reading? We teach them sight words so that it builds on those skills, so that we can teach them reading in a more systematic manner. But a lot of times with behavior, we say, okay, go ahead and line up, and we teach it in kindergarten, and then we never come back to it. And we just assume that they should know exactly the way that they should do it. The problem is, is we need to practice those skills over and over and over again. And that's why we go through those PBIS skills that you guys should be working on. You guys got PBIS, right? Yeah, that you guys should be working on. You go over those skills over and over and over and over and over again until it becomes so ingrained that they become automatic. So when you say line up, their brain doesn't even engage. Their just body just goes right over and they line up exactly how they're supposed to. We have to practice those skills. Okay? Don't take it personally. This is hard. This is really hard. Because you guys come to school to be able to help kids, and then they say mean and nasty things to you. And then we go home, and we go, I can't believe that kid said something about me about that. They do, and kids know exactly the right thing to be able to get to their like eyebrows, and you're like, oh, how'd you know? Okay? <coughs> but we can't take it personally. Here's the deal. You confronting their behavior is the exact right thing to do. You guys are in the right. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's you, or you, or you doing it. Nobody likes being told what to do, or that they're wrong. So kids who lack social skills, or they have a social skills deficit, what they have is they react poorly to it. You know the only thing that can fix that, the only thing that can actually fix that or, or reduce that is the relationship that you've built with the kid. The person that doesn't know that person and confronts their behavior might get more of a lash back. Or if you and that kid have battled back and forth, they're going to make you pay for it. But if you have a good relationship that you build over time, it reduces that. And that's our goal. We can't take it personally because it's not you, it's the kid. The kid doesn't know how to react, and so that's how they react. Now, I said don't take it personally. In the very next slide, I'm going to say take it personally. Okay, we have to come to school with that idea that every single day we are going to make a difference and we're going to save some kid's life. We're going to work hard to be able to advance them as much as possible so that when they go out into the real world, they stand a chance, and that's our hope. Right? Now, there's also this other person that you may have to contend with in your school. I 
don't think they have them in Beatrice anymore, but let me introduce you to Mrs. Crabapple. Mrs. Crabapple is that teacher who should have retired when she was 23 because it's obvious that she hates kids. She brags about things like half of my class is failing because I'm such a tough teacher. Let me tell you, if half your class is failing, you're a bad teacher. That's a bad teacher. And I'll tell them, you send them my way, okay? They live to teach Sally. They live to teach Sally. They don't want anything to do with Billy. And you know what? The people that they write movies about are the ones who can take Billy and teach him those things that can turn that kid around. They don't write movies about how, how Sally, who was privileged all of her life, got this great thing. They don't write about teachers and parents who do that. They write about the ones who can save other kids' lives, okay? You have to be there to counteract that person. Now, luckily for us, they're not going to be actress, okay? Norris has a million of them, okay? <laughs> Just a second. All right, now, from a PBIS lens, this is going to make people upset. And I'm so sorry. But punishment works. It does. If punishment works. But here's the problem. Punishment works for about 75% of the kids. It works really, really well for Sally. You send Sally to the office and that will fix that problem. Mom and dad will come in, we'll have meetings, we'll have a bunch of different things happening. She's gonna go home, get grounded, she won't have a phone and she's not gonna do that anymore. But for the 25% of the kids that we really need this stuff for, like Billy, punishment doesn't work. It just simply doesn't work. Keeping them after school, Send them in from recess, put them on the buddy bench or suspension, expulsion, those kind of things. It just doesn't work because what truly needs to happen is they need to be taught. They need to be taught because they have, remember, a skill deficit. Okay? Also, a lot of times they want to escape school, so when you suspend those kids, it's reinforcing for us because maybe we have a normal classroom that day, but for Billy, he just goes, I know exactly now what I need to do to get out of here. And what happens if a kid doesn't go to school? What do you think happens? Do you think, it's, do you think he's sitting there in his room all by himself thinking about his behavior? No. No. What he's not getting is any kind of education. And when he doesn't get any education, he gets further behind. The further behind that he gets, the less he wants to be in school. The less he wants to be in school, the more he does behavior in order to be able to get out. And now we have a kid that graduated high school that doesn't have any skills, doesn't have any knowledge, and what happens to them. Oftentimes, not great things. Okay? You know what's better? Reinforcement. Reinforcement and study after study after study after study has shown to be uh, more effective than punishment. Now, I can tell you that the power of praise, you guys will hear over and over and over again, we need to have more praise, we need to have more praise, we need to have more praise. Four to one positive praise. How many people have heard that? Four positive comments for every one criticism or one correction. Four, four to one, four to one, four to one. Okay, here's the problem with that is that a lot of times we don't teach people how to do it. Now, I'm going to go over just a quick recap of some research so you understand how effective it can be. Uh, in a study of 79 teachers, one positive comment was given for every six corrections. That's not a whole lot. And those same people who did that study went back uh, um, several years later, and what they saw was that... Uh, even though teachers and parents knew that positive praise was valuable, they still didn't do it. Even though they know what's right, they still don't do it. It works for us, too. Okay? In 2000, they showed that, that students got praised roughly 1.2 to 4.5 times per hour per student. Now, who do you think was getting the majority of that praise? Do you think it was Sally or Billy? Sally. Sally, in fact, was getting praised three times the amount of any of the other kids in the class, and Billy was getting way less than that. Now, here's the thing. If we want to correct Billy's behavior, Billy needs three times the amount of praise than anybody else in the room. Now, here's what I hear people tell me. Well, Matt, they don't give us a whole lot to work with. Well, does our kid in the fifth grade that has a first grade reading level, do they give us a whole bunch to work with? No. No. But you know what? We start them at the base level and we build up. Okay. Um, in 2008, a guy by the name of Howard Wills did a study, and what he showed was that um, when he went in and did a, a, a study, and he saw teachers were giving one positive comment for every three correction, and the class was on task about half the time, 56% of the time, the class was doing what the teacher wanted. Okay? 
The only intervention done to the classroom was with the teachers, and the teachers shot up to 12 positive comments for every one correction, and what they saw was that the class was on task 85% of the time. 85% of the time. Now imagine what can be taught. If 85% of the time every kid was doing exactly what the teacher wanted, that's simply from praise. Because kids crave that. They crave that. Uh, students have shown to increase the amount of academic responses when the only change to the classroom environment was increased praise. So they felt more comfortable with answering the question or at least raising their hand to try. Children with emotional and behavior disorders are more sensitive to both positive praise and corrections, which is why when you correct Sally and you go, Sally, knock it off, don't do that. She just goes, okay. Or when you go, hey, Sally, great job on that book. Okay. When we say, Billy, put that down, don't do that. What? God, why are you always picking on me? God. Okay, we might get that response. Okay, because they're more sensitive to those corrections, but they're also more sensitive to that positive praise. Billy, that was awesome. Way to go, man. I love it. And you know what happens? He sits up a little straighter. He gets a smile on his face. He likes that. He craves it. So our kids with emotional behavior disorders, the more that we praise them, the more that they soak up that. Okay? As the grades increase, we do praise less. You go into a preschool classroom, you go into a kindergarten classroom, you can't walk in without somebody saying nice things something nice about you. Oh my gosh, Mr. McDowell, look at him, he's so good. Oh, you just feel good walking in this place like that. You walk into a senior government classroom, oh my God, it's McNabb. Okay? The more that we pray, we need to increase that praise as they get higher up in the levels. Okay? It increases their self-awareness, it increases their self-esteem, it increases them doing more for you. Teachers have, uh, research has shown that the more frequent criticism that we give to kids, the more the teachers will say they have ADHD, they have withdrawn behavior, they don't think very much of themselves. Which means the more that we tell somebody that they suck, the more that they're going to think that they suck. Huh, who knew that? So alternatively, the uh, more frequent praise that we give, teachers will report less withdrawal behavior, less hyperactive behavior. So you got that kid bouncing across the walls, start giving them more praise. The problem is, is that we oftentimes don't teach teachers or parents how to give praise correctly because it's not just about good job, way to go, nice job, nice job. Okay, teaching praise, you got to teach, you got to teach it um, from a perspective of what they do. Okay, so let me give you an example. <coughs> thank you so much for having your notes out. Okay, so I said thank you so much for having your notes out. Gave her praise. But what else happened? Who else heard this? These people right here. So if I'm walking around all day going, hey, thank you for wearing your glasses today. I appreciate that. Hey, thank you so much for having your pen out ready to write. Okay, that is the academic, that's the behavioral equivalent to academics of me walking around going, nine times nine is 81. <coughs> 3 times 3 is 9. 4 times 4 is 16. Just walking around giving math facts so the kids in green. If I'm constantly reminding kids exactly what the behavior is that they should do, even if it's not for the kid that's misbehaving, I'm going, hey, thank you so much for having your book out. The kid over here is going, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be on my book. <coughs> okay. And then when I see that from that kid that maybe doesn't transition so well, I'm going to go over Thank you so much for getting your book out. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Okay? So I always say it's always do it from a thank you, I appreciate what you're doing perspective. Because that teaches all those other kids constantly how to be able to do it. But it is not in our nature to give positive praise. It just isn't. It isn't in our nature to give positive praise. In fact, evolutionarily, we are ingrained and hardwired to find the faults in other people. Okay? You can turn on any TV station. My wife and her sisters like to watch the red carpet, not because they like to see the pretty dresses, but they like to see somebody who just train wrecked themselves just in some <laughs> awful outfit. That's what they, how many other people in here do that? <laughs> they get wine together just to trash those beautiful celebrities, right? Okay, we have to train ourselves to be able to do it. Okay, so you can cue yourself. Put your phone on vibrate every two minutes, put it in your pocket every time it goes off, we give positive praise to somebody in that classroom. 
Thank you so much for doing it. And we can always find something. We can always find something, okay? So you can do that. You can use visual cues. Um, how many people in here are clock watchers? I mean, except for right now. <laughs> I was. So I had a red dot on my clock. So every time I looked at that red dot, that was a reminder that I needed to give positive praise to somebody, okay? Uh, you can use self-monitoring. So you can move pennies or paper clips from one pocket to the other, but I'll tell you, 40 pennies in one pocket <laughs> weighs you down a little bit. What I actually started doing, there's golf tickers and, and counters. So you can go and buy those for about $2.99, and you carry those around and you click them. Okay, every time you get positive praise. Now, with self-monitoring, the reason why self-monitoring is so effective is the more that you are aware of your behavior, the more that you do that behavior. So if you're trying to keep track of calories, Weight Watchers, points. Okay, the reason why I'm losing some weight right now is because I'm self-monitoring. I'm constantly aware of the intake of what's going into my body. When it comes to things like positive praise, the more that you see the number going up and you reach 40, you're like, maybe I could reach 50 positive comments to kids today. Maybe I could reach 60, maybe I can reach 70. The more that we do it, the better we get. Um, student recruiting, if a kid comes up and says, look at what I did, isn't this great? That is a perfect opportunity. Take, take 10 seconds to acknowledge what that kid did. Guess what I did this weekend with my dad? We went deer hunting. Take two minutes and just say, how was it? Was it pretty awesome? Yeah, did you get anything? No, but man, it was awesome. We had hot chocolate and it was great. Because what that kid is doing is he is coming to you, that adult wanting your approval and that connection from you. That's a high honor. That's a high honor to have. Okay, performance feedback, you can have competition, self-record, written praise. I've done a lot of written praise. You take post-it notes. I told you about Adam. Adam didn't do well with positive praise. Anybody have those kids that you go, great job on this, and then they go, eh, screw you. Okay? You're like, man, bring back. Okay? <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> Edit that. Okay. Um, well, Adam was that kid. You know, I go, hey, thank you so much for, for turning in that assignment on time. And he walked by and knocked over my pencil jar. Be like, man. Anyway, so I stopped giving him verbal praise, and so what I started to do was writing at the top of his paper. I love having you in class. You're one of my favorite kids. Learn that phrase. You are one of my favorite kids. Tell it to as many kids as you can. You are one of my favorite kids. Because it's tough to hate somebody who likes you, okay? But also, you want those kids to believe it, and you should believe that that kid is one of my favorite kids. That's one of my kids. Okay? It gives you ownership, that gives you assistance, that gives you help, and that helps to build that relationship with that kid. So I would write those things on this paper. I'd walk by his, uh, in, in, in the room that I was uh, uh, helping with, and I'd just go, hey, you're doing a great job, and I'd drop it on his desk, and I'd just walk away. And sometimes he'd crumple it up, sometimes he'd put it in his back pocket. I didn't know what happened to it, but I did it for a while with him. When he graduated, he brought in his shoebox, and I said, Adam, what is this? And he goes, well, I got something for you. I go, there's no holes in this. I hope whatever you brought is still alive. <laughs> Shut up. Okay, so he drops it on my desk. And he, and he goes, and I open it up, and it's a ton of these post-it notes. It's, a ton of, it's ripped off, pops of paper, all that kind of stuff in there. And I'm just like, oh, my God. And he goes, I bet you didn't think that was going to be in the box. And I said, out of all the things that were going to be in the box, that was not going to be the thing. Adam had a pretty rough home life. Um, and because somebody cared about him, his stepmom really didn't like him very much. His dad worked a lot of hours. And things didn't always go well for him. But, but when things got rough, he had proof. He had evidence. How many of you have had that card written by somebody that you respect or that letter that somebody wrote? that talked about how great you were. Some of you still have those. You cherish those. Kids do as well, okay? All right, you can also experiment with different praise types, sandwich praise. I'm not saying we don't, we don't correct. We continue to correct. Sandwich praise is this. Thank you so much for getting out your book. Now don't forget to get out your pencil. But thank you for getting out your book. Praise, correction, praise, okay? 
You can have different uh, uh, nonverbal codes, thumbs up, way to go. Um, uh, I used to do this with high school kids where I team teach. Uh, we had a teacher that would do a round of applause or everybody give this kid a big hand and we'd all go up. Now, the very first time kids were just like up. But by the end of the year, if Billy got a, everybody give him a big hand, everybody go up. And man, you just saw that kid pride. Okay? You can do those things in class too. Talk to the teachers ahead of time if you're going to do something like that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Behavior is a skill deficit. Okay, I've been talking about this. Sometimes the regular way that we teach things doesn't necessarily work. Okay, sometimes we have to attack it from a different angle. My son Jackson, the oldest one who's a senior now, in the first grade, we got a phone call from the school, from the teacher, who said, um, Jackson isn't keeping his hands to himself. Now, um, a lot of pride from the behavior consultant for that district uh, that now my kid is the behavior problem. That was great. Now, he didn't hit kids or anything like that, but he was the kid that... Um, you know where there should only be two people in line? Well, you got all five ADHD boys just run to that spot, and then there's pushing and shoving. He would hold kids' coats, and as they tried to pull away, he'd let them go, okay, so that they'd fall flat. He gave a lot of wet willies, okay? That was, that was not kind of him. He swatted a girl in the butt once. That wasn't good. And he goes, well, Dad, she stuck it out at me. And so I'm like, Dad, I'm like, what? And I'm like, no, especially not dead. That's the devil right there. Okay, anyway. <coughs> Got to teach them young. Anyway, so my wife and I, we used to teach and train kids that did drive-by shootings. We're like, we got this. Two months later, we're still like, why can't this kid get it? Okay? Every day. Before he got on the bus, keep your hands to yourself, keep your hands to yourself, keep your hands to yourself. What are you going to do? Keep, your hands, keep my hands to myself. You come home at night. What, what, how did school go today? Well, could have been better. Okay? <laughs> so we talk through things. We talk it to death. Until one day, my wife said, Jackson, other people don't like being touched. And you saw him like a cocker spaniel just trying to figure something out. It had not occurred to this kid that all the time of them going, Jackson, Jackson, stop it, Jackson, let it quit. That it didn't even occur to him. Didn't even occur to that boy that they didn't like it. And guess what? He was dried up. Because we just have to sometimes see it from a different angle. I'm going to give you guys an example right now of that. Okay, so this is a perfect example where I see the picture very clearly. And in many of our classes, we see this too. There are some of you that can see it right away. There are some of you that are like, oh, yeah, I can see it, and they don't see it. And then there's other people who are like, I have no clue. And that's exactly what it's like producing new lessons in a class. Okay? So, I know exactly what this is. How many people still don't see it? And, and you're not supposed to, and that's okay, you don't see it. All right. There's a lot more that can't see it. I know you can't see it. That's okay. All right. You can't see it. Now, who, who can't see it? Okay. So, you can't see it. What's your name? Alicia. Okay, you, you still got roped in. So, Alicia. All right. <laughs> It's a cow. I'm got okay, so it's a cow. People see it now? Do you see it now or are you joking with me? No, I see it. No, you still don't see it. Okay, but you've seen a cow before. Okay, so I'm gonna break out this is a this is a little um, teaching strategy that goes all the way back to Aristotle. Okay, so we're gonna go all the way back to the Greeks for this. And I hope it works. Okay? Alicia. Try harder. <laughs> yeah? 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 Did that work? No. no. Okay, so that didn't work. Try hard, it didn't work, but you've seen it count before. What if I said I'll give you five bucks if you see it? You'll lie. You'll lie. What if I said everybody in here is going to stay till five without pay if you don't see it? People are going to be like, it's right there. Okay. So, you've seen it count. Now, I'm going to show you how to be able to see it. Now, the great way, the great thing about knowledge is you can't take it away. Do you see it now? It was right there in front of you, okay? Now I take this away, do you still see it? Absolutely, you still see it. Because once you teach it from a different angle, it doesn't matter sometimes how often you tell a kid. Sometimes you just got to change it up, okay? All right, because practice makes perfect. The more that we practice a behavior, the better we get at it. 
Okay, this is an example of what we can do with practice just a short amount of time. It, this is somebody who practiced drawing over six years. Now, if we look at the first picture, the amount of improvement from the first picture to the second picture is profound. And the same in this play. First one's Carrie Underwood, and the only reason why I know it is because she said it's Carrie Underwood, but the sex, second one looks like it. With our kids like Billy that are so far down there in social skills, a little bit of practice gets them a long way down the road. Where Sally's going to be at that 2013 over there. She's going to be way over there already. We just need to fine tune some stuff. With that picture on the left and going to the right, the more that we practice the skill, the better we get it. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to tell you is to never give up. We got all sorts of kids coming to our school, and you know what? Tomorrow, there's going to be a kid that comes into the school that had a bad night. There are kids that over the summer got abused. There are kids over the summer that lost people that were close to them, that moved <coughs> in, that don't have any friends. We got all sorts of kids coming to school, and all they need is that one person to be able to be a champion for them because it's not going to be that lady. It's not going to be Crab Apple. But it can absolutely be you. When those kids look back in 25 years, you guys can all, if I said, who's your favorite teacher, who was the per favorite person that you had in school, who was your favorite parent, whoever it is, you guys get it right away, right into your head. If I also said, who was the most horrible person to you in school, you also remember that. <laughs> So who do you want to be? Are you going to be a champion for that kid? Are you going to be that person who takes care of two kids like that? Those are my worlds. They go to Tri-County, and every single day, my hope is that they come back a little bit better than they were before. I am so very grateful for the work that you do with the kids, because those are the kids that have the worst lot in life. Those are the kids that need the most help. Those are the kids that need that champion. So I want to thank you for what you do. If there's questions, here's my information. Um, these guys all have it. Um, and so if you need anything, please let me know. I know it's right at a quarter tail. And so I'll stick around for a little bit if there's any questions or anything like that. Do you guys have anything? Matt will be back on the third Wednesday with more behavior information and it's doing a time uh, if you want me to, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. We'll do some strategies and then we'll talk through some stuff. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.